Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Now, despite being built the same year as the Saturn V that took men to the moon, my old GMC truck actually has more computing power in its taillight than the entire lunar rocket had. But I should back up a bit and explain why. You see, a few years ago, I bought this exquisitely well-preserved, but very well-used 1970 GMC Sierra Grande custom camper Longhorn truck. It had spent the first 40 years of its life with a family from California that used it to tour America with a camper on top. By the time I found it, the original owners, Fred and Jesse Clother, had both passed away. That's when I bought it and brought it home to restore here in Dave's Garage, back when it was just Dave's Garage. When I was a kid growing up in the winters of Saskatchewan, our daily family vehicle had been my dad's 1968 GMC pickup, and so I too wanted a GMC truck just for nostalgic reasons. Unlike my dad's ultra-basic work truck, however, I wanted a nicely optioned unit. Now, like a lot of people who set out to find and restore one of these trucks, I was originally searching for a short bed example with air conditioning and ideally a big block engine. That would mean I was looking for a Sierra Grande with a custom camper trim package, the highest trim level. When I found this example, it ticked all the boxes except it was a seriously heavy duty unit. Rather than being a short box, it was actually a Longhorn with an additional 9-inch bed extension from the factory to accommodate the biggest slide-in campers of the day. Designated as a 3 quarter ton but with a 1 ton chassis, it was so original and unmolested that I simply fell in love with it. When I took it apart, I didn't even need impact tools to take the suspension apart as there was zero rust anywhere underneath. Everything came apart with simple hand tools. Wherever it lived in California seems to have had an abundance of red dirt, however. My guess is a San Joaquin Valley, but I don't know how to pronounce that actually either, but I'm interested to hear your guesses in the comments. Pretty soon I embraced the heavy duty theme and came to really appreciate the one ton frame, the big eight lug wheels, the heavy duty brakes, and so on. In terms of options, it has almost everything available at that time. Bucket seats, AM FM, air conditioning, tack, tilt, and a big block engine. Trucks in those days were almost always work vehicles, not the luxury family rollers that we've come to know and love today. That means most were very spartan and finding one like this with a lot of options is actually quite rare. Some things like cruise control, power windows and power seats however were not offered even as options. For a power plant, this truck features an engine you might recognize from the Chevelle SS396, except its cam timing trades some high end horsepower for more low end torque. By 1970 GM had upped the displacement from 396 to 402 but then labeled it as a 400 so it's a confusing year to be sure. Plus, there was a 400 small block, but not in the trucks. I had a retired NASCAR engine builder machine and completely rebuild the engine, and then I had the whole thing tuned live on an engine dyno by a retired GM carburetor wizard. In the end, I spent a solid five years here in my shop restoring every single nut, bolt, clamp, wire, and every other part in the vehicle to like new condition while the body itself was sent to Muscle Car Restorations in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin for fresh paint. And then once painted, I got the truck back and did the reassembly, upholstery, electrical, and so on. I did all of the mechanical suspension and all the other work here in the shop. As a result, today it's like a brand new 1970 truck, restored entirely to original factory specs, and it runs like one too. You can find more information about my truck in the February 2024 issue of Hemings Classic Car Magazine, and I'll put a link to that article in the video description. The biggest lesson I learned over the course of the restoration, beyond taking your time to do things right, was to take more photos. I had bought a waterproof camera so that I could get it dirty and then get it greasy and so on and clean it easily, and then I took about 350 pictures during the disassembly. It turns out I should have taken about three times as many because the things you think that are obvious now won't be five years from now when it comes time to put back together and you've only got one photo angle to work with. I like to keep my restorations as stock as possible and this truck is no exception. I do tend, however, to make a few concessions related to safety. At first, I thought I would relocate the fuel tank because it's located directly behind the driver's seat. But as my old friend Jim wisely pointed out, if you get hit hard enough in this truck to deform the internal fuel tank, it's probably the least of your problems at that point. So discretion being the better part of valor, I left that much alone. So the first real safety modification I did make was to add a set of three-point seat belts to replace the factory lap belt setup. That way if I run into something, at least I've got a shot at surviving. But what if somebody runs into me? And even worse, what if they hit me from behind? Because this truck doesn't even have headrests, so the only thing cushioning your head in a rear end collision is the truck's thick glass rear window but at least the skull fracture will distract you from the whiplash. That whole scenario was made more likely by the fact that this truck has only a pair of 26 watt incandescent taillights. 
Since it was built 14 years before they became standard, it also doesn't have the center brake light at all. Now I'm fortunate that the truck does feature a special disc brake emblem to warn people behind me that I might stop quickly at any time. But if I did, there's just not much to alert the folks behind me that I'm actually doing so. The first lighting related task I did then was to adapt the truck's cargo lamp on the back of the cab. It still works as a basic white light for the bed, but I also added a huge internal LED inside the housing and then connected that to the braking circuit. So now the cargo lamp serves dual duty as just a white utility light, plus it's the CHMSL, or center high mount stoplight that all cars have today. I figured that couldn't hurt, but I wasn't convinced that it was sufficient to mitigate the danger in today's modern cell phone distracted suburban traffic, so I wanted something more. And since I tinker with the ESP32 all the time, I figured it would make a good basis for a project. And that means that today we're going to look at building a real live project that combines software, electronics, and mechanics. Building an LED based dynamic third brake light system for the truck, but without modifying the truck in any way. This system will connect to the factory trailer connector only and control an otherwise hidden LED strip below the tailgate. We'll use a $2 ESP32 dual core processor to run the system and power it with a 5 volt buck converter tied into the truck's electrical power. I'll show you how to properly interface with the signals and brakes, which will give us a very visible set of sequential taillights, a strobing brake light, an intensely bright backup light, hazard mode, and even a multicolor emergency mode for police and fire vehicles. So before building my own, I looked at what was available on Amazon, and the only one I could find that even offered sequential amber lights was about $100. Unfortunately, the widest version I could find of it was only 60 inches wide, and my truck is 80 inches wide, so that would leave quite a gap. I was confident I could build my own, a custom one of any length, and I could do it for less and make it behave exactly as I wanted. And for once, a crazy LED project of mine would actually serve a practical purpose. How could I not do it? Now, I can't promise that it does, but I try hard to make this strip ostensibly legal under the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, or at least as far as I could understand them. From my reading, the third brake light can flash once lit, but it must come on immediately when you hit the brake. And so, even though the third brake light animates on the way in, it begins with a significant portion lit from the very start. It's tied into the factory brake lights and operates in conjunction with the high mount center stop lamp that I also added. The hazards are triggered when both brake lights are seen pulsing, and it incorporates both the strobe and the expansion effects for maximum visibility, which is of course highly desirable if you're parked or broken down in a hazardous location. When it comes time to back up, the entire strip illuminates in full bright white. This is the most demanding part of the project electrically, as it takes anywhere from 45 to 75 watts, depending on how wide your strip is. There's also the emergency vehicle mode, which I think would be very handy for police undercover vehicles that do not have or want a full light bar. I don't even wire this feature up in my own vehicle, of course, because I don't want it triggering accidentally for any reason, but it's fun to hotwire and demo it inside the garage. The first thing we need then are some LEDs. My go-to LED strip is almost always the waterproof WS2812B from BTF Lighting. It runs on 5 volts as does the ESP32 board itself, so clearly we're going to need some way to come up with 5 volt supply that can run not only the microcontroller, but that can also power the entire LED strip. And if they're going to be ballpark 300 LEDs, each one can consume about 50 milliamps, meaning we need about 15 amps of current, which at 5 volts means a maximum of 75 watts. Now that's a substantial buck converter, but I just happen to have a few 75 watt examples on hand. To be honest though, if I were starting this project fresh, I would look towards using a 12 volt LED strip. You'll still need a 5 volt converter to run the ESP32 itself, but the LED strip would then run on the truck's native 12 volt bus, rather than through a transformer or converter. Of course, it would also then sometimes spike up to like 14.7 as the alternator charged and so on, so it's got to be tolerant of at least that. With a buck converter, you do get a much more stable voltage. For maximum brightness and continuity, we'll be using the highest density strips that I could find at 144 pixels per meter. You can also go down to 60 and even 30 per meter at a much reduced cost, but they don't look like a solid line and are nowhere near as bright. Now, either way, we're going to need three things at a minimum. Ground, 12 volt power, and some way to interface with the truck's signals so that we know when the truck is turning or stopping. All of this is available at the truck's trailer connector. Most trucks today, and even many cars, are already pre-wired for a trailer. Sometimes the wiring is just bundled up under the bumper rather than nicely exposed as a plug, usually as it is with a truck. Regardless, the problem is that there are many different formats of trailer connectors, such as 4 and 5 and 7 pin setups. And that's just here in North America. There are also ISO standards for up to 15 pins. I think we should assume what I believe is the most common case on a truck. 
a seven pin trailer plug. That means we only have the most basic of signals though. Tail lights, left turn, right turn, backup, power, and ground. That's it. Typically, there is a brake signal wire, but it's not active unless the vehicle has an electronic brake controller, which isn't always true, so we can't rely on it being there. You can also do it with a 5-pin if you're willing to source power for it separately, and even go to a 4-pin if you can forego the backup feature. Worst case, a suitably experienced tech could also interface with most older vehicles by tapping directly into the taillight wiring. Now, if there's no brake pin at the connector, how do we know when the vehicle is stopping? To solve this, we monitor the left and right turn pins. If they both go on within a small time window, we know the user is hitting the brakes because in older vehicles the brake lighting is really nothing more than both signal lights turned on at the same time. Now the simpler but incorrect solution would be to assume braking whenever both signal lights are active, but it's not that simple unfortunately because you can be braking and signaling at the same time. When you are doing so, both lights start out as on but then the turning side will flash off and on. For example, let's say you hit the brakes and come to a stop. We see both left and right signals active because the brake is depressed and we correctly start the brake strobe animation. But then the driver signals left which starts to cycle the left turn signal. If we relied on both signals being high to indicate braking, we'd turn off the brake light as soon as the signal blinked off. And we'd restart the animation every time it came back on. That's why we need the extra bit of logic to latch the brake state on only when both left and right lights come on at the same time or near to it. We turn it off as soon as both signal pins go back low again. While it's great that we have these signals we can rely on, how do we connect them to the ESP32 chip? After all, the truck is a 12 volt system and the ESP32 expects no more than 3.3 volts on any input line. I wondered for a bit if it could be done with a voltage divider, and maybe it can, I'd tell me in the comments if so if I could have done this with a couple of resistors, but I also wanted to have some isolation between the truck's higher power signals and our little chip. The voltage in a car's circuit can range from 12 volts to nearly 15 volts at times, and it can be quite noisy. So what I wound up doing is that when a signal from the truck's 12 volt system comes in, like left signal, that signal is used to close a relay that is capable of accepting just such a 12 volt trigger source. The 12 volt trigger is used to energize a magnetic coil in the relay switch which closes the switch, and that allows current to flow from the ESP32 back into one of its own input pins, and so the only thing the ESP32 is ever reading is its own voltage. The truck opens and closes the relay switches, but the power from the truck is never routed or connected into a signal line on the chip. I next built a version using optocouplers that works equally well. Now an optocoupler is an incredibly simple and kind of ingenious device. It's basically two pairs of pins, one connected to an internal LED. Now you can't see it, it's all hidden within the black chip itself. And the other set of pins is connected to an internal light sensor. So when you power the one set of pins, it turns on that internal LED, which immediately triggers the light sensor, which lets the current flow between the other pins. Long story short, it's a switch you can turn off and on by the absence or presence of power on the input side. When the 12 volts comes in from the left or right turn signal, for example, it activates the left turn pin on the chip, just as the relay would, but without the mechanical complications of a magnetic coil and switch. It also turns out that many relay boards that I've seen also isolate their triggers with optocouplers anyway, so the relay is actually a bit redundant and truly only needed for higher power applications than switching in just simple inputs. But hey, I'm a software guy from Microsoft. I'll get it right by version 3. The system is composed of about five major components. First, there's the trailer connector. That's where we pick up all the lines for the left turn, the right turn, the backup, 12 volt power, and ground. We feed that 12 volts into a 75 watt DC buck converter that produces 5 volts for us. We then use that 5 volts to power both the computer circuit, the ESP32, and the LED strip itself. The LED strip itself has a simple 3 wire connection. Up to 15 amps of 5 volt power and ground from the buck converter plus a data wire from an output pin on the ESP32 MCU. That data wire contains the square wave signal that is generated by the chip that controls the colors of each individual LED. For a typical strip the size of 2 meters, it can be updated about 100 times per second. Next, I'll take you on a brief tour of the code that runs the show. Now, don't worry, I won't spend too much time or get in too deep, and you might find it actually a gentle introduction into how microcontroller projects are normally set up. If you have any familiarity with C, it might help to know that everything starts in main.cpp, where you supply two functions, setup and loop. On an ESP32 project that is most basic, code is broken up into those two major sections, setup and loop. The setup code is called one time when the chip boots, and it's where you define one time things as such as what pins do what. Then after setup is complete, loop is called repeatedly for as long as the chip continues to run. 
Our loop code will check the input signals, update the state of the lights, draw whatever signal or breaking effect is required by the situation, and then move on and loop again. Looking at the setup code, there are two points of interest. The first is where four pins are set to be inputs and told to use their internal pull-down resistors. There's one for left turn, one for right turn, one for backup, and one for emergency lights. Recall that these will be fed a high signal from the 3.3 volt bus whenever the corresponding circuit on the truck is energized. Next, for each of those pins, we request that the CPU attach an interrupt such that if any of those pins change state, our interrupt handler is called. For example, every time the state of the left turn bulb changes, whether turning from off to on or on to off, the left turn IRQ function will be called under interrupt each and every time. An interrupt means that the CPU will immediately stop whatever it was doing, push all of its state onto the stack, and immediately call the left turn IRQ function every time the switch changes state. It happens immediately, without delay, as long as interrupts are not explicitly disabled somehow. The purpose of all this is to debounce the switches. When a physical switch changes state, it doesn't do it atomically. In fact, a switch can bounce off and on many times as it's closing. You don't want to accept a new input state, like the switch going from off to on, unless the new input state has been stable for some minimum amount of time, like 30 milliseconds. The switch will actually bounce open and close a few times before it settles. With a fast CPU, if you're monitoring the switch, you'd see each one of those as an off and on transition and an interrupt. Worse, it's random, if so, if you were to press a key on your keyboard and the keyboard was handled that way, it might close once or three times or seven times, depending on how hard you hit it you'd end up with duplicate characters for every keystroke. This was a very real bug in the very first release of the TRS-80 4K Model 1 Level 1, which I happened to own. The first thing you learned to do every time upon booting was to load a special keyboard debounce program from cassette to make the machine actually usable. It's such a basic thing that I've always been surprised they shipped it that way, and the story of how they did is kind of one I'd love to hear, but I've not talked to any Tandy engineers that seem to know. If you know the story, let me know in the comments. Once the chip is set up, our loop code really just calls process and display inputs over and over. That code in turn gives each button a chance at processing the current inputs by calling its check for button press function. Next, we see some special logic that is monitoring the left and right turn signals. This is required because as noted, there's no brake signal available in the connector. With a simple utility or boat trailer, each side's brake light is controlled separately and braking is handled by lighting up both at once. Signaling is handled by turning one of the lights off and on. If the taillights are also on, that's handled by a separate filament in the lamp and our hardware circuit ignores them entirely. If the brakes are hit while signaling, both lamps come on at once and then one starts blinking to indicate that a turn in that direction. So as noted earlier, we can't merely rely on whether looking at both right and left are on at the same time as an indication of braking. We also have to make sure they came on at the same time, more or less. I've defined more or less as 50 milliseconds in the code. We then keep the braking effect active until both the left and right turn lines go inactive. That means the driver has lifted off the brake, and so we end the effect. Once the code has considered all the inputs and updated what effects are active, each effect is given its opportunity to draw the LED strip, and then a strip is rendered and turned on. This is done in priority order so that higher priority effects draw later and get to overwrite any lower priority effects. I've placed all the code on GitHub for your bench and off-road testing pleasure, but of course there's no warranty that any of this is legal, safe, or appropriate for roadway use, so use due care and attention. If you found any of today's episode to be interesting or entertaining, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And if you're already a subscriber, thanks. Please consider turning on all notifications for the channel so that you don't miss an episode. And if once a week turns out to be too often, you can always turn it back off. Now, if you or someone you know may be on the autism spectrum, check out the free sample of my book on Amazon. It's everything I know now about living your best life on the spectrum. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.